good, let's get into the Word of God a little bit deeper uh, in picture and type and everything we've seen in the glory of God. May all our days be for His glory. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 7, we're back into our study of love never fails. We, we uh, took a little bit of a break from our study. We've been in Christ alone and we ought to remain. Those messages, of course, are only for the title of it, but in Christ alone ought to be the way we, we walk, the way we go. What a great theme and a great uh, conference we had in the Spirit of God uh, from Song of Solomon all the way through to Philippians chapter number 3 and everywhere in between. We thank Pastor George again. And, uh, of course, the, the Sunday after our conference, so that was the first Sunday, and then those few days, the second Sunday of October, I preached a sermon on, of sermons and looked at a little bit of a review and some highlights of the conference and those sermons that Pastor George did preach, uh, preach uh, from Sunday morning and then Monday evening, Tuesday and Wednesday. And then, of course, last Sunday I said uh, ahead of time I would like to speak to you about our commitment card. And this commitment card is very, very important. If you do not have one, then you can grab one in the lobby. There's many. They also can grab one up here at the basket. So this basket will be here to the end of the year. What does this card represent? It represents your commitment to missions giving. It's above your regular tithe offering. It's your grace gift above saying, God, I want to give to a missionary or two. I want to give to the mission support of our church. We, we uh, support over 30 missionaries. And some of them we support at 300 a month, 200 a month, and uh, just a few at 100. But our mission support team will be meeting again in November. We will uh, meet five to six times a year. And we'll be looking at the commitments. So that's part of it. But the other half was our special offering. And each year we have a special offering. And it may be tied together to a missionary that we support. Or it may be something uh, here. And as your pastor has led this year, it says special offering for our pastoral staff. So last Sunday, I spoke about um, in Christ alone out of Colossians chapter number 3. and went a little further than our theme verses and spoke about that special offering. I've shared some things about where we're at financially. It's uh, um, something where I've done financial reports on Wednesdays, midweek, not done something like that on the Sunday. But uh, we also wasn't really a financial report as much as it was your pastor just putting before you. And uh, it really is the first time I've ever spoken to you directly in that manner because I did put on a card. Hey, there's a special offering we'd like to take up. As God puts it upon your heart over the next few months as you pray by the end of the year, drop it in the basket. And so we'll know if you've already done something in regards to that special offering Thank you and praise the Lord. I'm very thankful for that. But as we went into the first week of October, we knew it would be our missions conference time, our Acts 1-8 conference, and we would put Love Never Fails on hold for a little bit, but the Bible's still here, <laughs> and we can still come back to it anytime. We didn't go away from the Bible, but we used, of course, a different text that was more topical in nature. Well, we're back to 1 Corinthians, Love Never Fails today, and I want to just remind you of a little bit for a couple of minutes, a little review and, and get you thinking about our series because here we are in chapter number 7 and uh, there's a lot of verses. We're going to cover the first 16 this morning, you know, try to take a, a short chunk of verses. Sometimes I take too much, but uh, try to be a little bit, uh, uh, sometimes my appetite spiritually is bigger than I can chew and all of us are kind of like that. Sometimes I just need to look at the Word of God. And just small, big chunks, maybe just uh, maybe one porterhouse steak a day and not two porterhouse steaks in a day. But we're going to get into 1 Corinthians chapter number 7. I want to remind you, though, a little bit of this theme, Love Never Fails. It says up on the screen there, uh, our theme verse about charity never faileth. And of course, that whole passage of scripture in 1 Corinthians 13, which we'll get to very shortly does remind us that you can speak and teach and have all the knowledge, but without charity you have nothing. And of course, that verse right there goes to the theme of our, our, uh, our series, Charity Never Faileth. 
But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Here's where we have used this little phrase a few times. Your love may come up short. Your love may fail others and even fail the Lord. But God's love never fails us. He never does. And now abideth faith, hope, charity. You know the verse, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. And of course, uh, Pastor George used that uh, verse to use an illustration about looking at what our desire is to be better. You look at your faith, which is from the past of God, always being faithful from the scriptures constantly, always being faithful to the place where you say, okay, faith from my past. And in the past, I look to hope as being something in the future. I'm going to be with Jesus Christ one day. Hallelujah. That's our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. We look at that. But charity is a whole lot about who we are now, what we're about today. Really simply, uh, we have had a study in 1 Corinthians, and our study has thus far covered a myriad, myriad of conflicts, failures, abuses of doctrine in the church. Even Paul, in his place of heaviness in dealing with all these, is quite pointed, but he comes to them with love. He knows that God used him to preach the word of God. The people got saved in, uh, in Corinth, and this is a uh, just a rough culture. The Grecian culture is disgusting and, and filled with uh, degradation and sin and filled just like just like today and a lot that you look around in American culture so he covers division and unity in the church he covers what it means to serve the Lord as a Christian versus serving yourself he covers the idea of following Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone he covers the idea of being filled with the Holy Spirit of God as the church is the temple of God and personally as we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. He covers morality. He covers those moral issues. He speaks of sexual sin as we got into last time in chapter number 6, chapter number 5. He's speaking of all the things of carnality and how, hey, in God's love that never fails, you need to get back to the essence of the gospel. So in chapter number 6, as we finished up, I just want to kind of refresh where we were four Sundays ago. I asked a question similar to this, but I'm going to ask it in a different way. Doesn't God set us free from sin so that we may be led by the Holy Spirit for his pleasure? Hasn't he freed you? You're born again. You're a child of God, and he's freed you from sin, no longer held captive by the chains of sin. You are going to sin. You are going to make a mess every once in a while. But it ought not to be that which you worship, the Holy Spirit of God is in you, and you're to be led by him. Yes, we are free from sin for his pleasure. Reminded of 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. Know ye not that you're the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, oh, what a terribly, terribly awful thing we can do. We can defile the temple of God. Him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are, as he speaks to the church are the temple of God. We personally are the temple of God. If you look at the context of chapter number three, you realize that it's about building your Christian life of the judgment seat and one day that your, all your works after salvation will be judged of whether they were going to be hay, wood, or stubble or gold, silver, and precious stones. But when you think about how we as the church are the building of the local church, it's pretty powerful. Not the physical, but the spiritual we know that God set us free so that it's for his pleasure the Spirit of God wants to lead us. I ask another question off of chapter number 6 at the last half of that chapter. Isn't the pursuit of a spirit-filled life of holiness in Jesus Christ better than sexual sin? I should say so. There should be a thousand amens. Because we know what that gets us into. It's messy. Yes, we're freed. Yes, we're to pursue the Holy Spirit of God, Spirit-filled life and holiness in Jesus. When we forsake our desires, our desires for his holiness. I wonder sometimes if we were just, just very simply honest, straight up, and transparent with God and ourselves and say, instead of saying, I wonder how I got into this mess. Boy, I'm just going through some awful times. 
maybe it's just because I've chosen to feed my flesh instead of feed the pleasures of the Lord Jesus Christ and His holiness. Because the scripture is true. There's the law of the mind, the law of your flesh, the law of sin, the law of God. And these are things in place by God to say, hey, you go my way and do the things that I put in your word, you're going to have trials and sufferings like my son Jesus Christ, but boy, oh, boy, boy, oh boy a spirit-filled life. It's kind of like this, 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. What? 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 Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? The last couple of verses of chapter 6. Ah! You had to get to the end to say that. Oh, yeah. But throughout that chapter of 20 verses, he's constantly interjecting what it means to be a member of Christ, to be in the Spirit of God's power and in the Spirit of God's leading, to know that you are the temple of God, for ye are bought with a price. I'm bought with a price. We are bought with a, pri with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. We just sung that. We just sung a song like that. May all my days, may all my days, be spent giving glory to God. You see, the presence of the Holy Spirit in the believer is very significant to God, wouldn't you say? Yes, he is. The Holy Spirit, he mentions him so very much. And so we go into chapter number 7. And now we find out that chapter number 7 brings to us something really important to God. And that's marriage. Now, quick disclaimer. This is not... A six-hour message on everything about marriage. Unless you ask me to do that, and then we can. None of you are very encouraging there. I, the Chiefs don't play till 3.30, right? I can go. This is very simply looking at the Word of God in the first 16 verses of chapter number 7 and saying, Okay, God. Your love never fails. Your love has never failed. Your love won't fail us in morality. Your love won't fail us in Christian servanthood. Your love won't fail us in the unity in the body of Christ. Your love will not fail us in marriage. How do I approach marriage? How do I see what God would have me to do in marriage? Well, there's a lot of questions about marriage. A lot of questions on how I deal with things. Let me just ask you a couple of them for introduction and we'll get right into the scripture. What, excuse me, which believer is more spiritual? The one that remains celibate or the one who marries? That's one of the questions that is asked here. Pretty good question. Should Christians divorce a non-Christian? Should singles marry to be spiritually all set with God? These are questions that are real. See, celibacy does come into play here, and we're going to see it, but I want you to just grab the context of these people. The Corinthian people, I mentioned it earlier, they got saved out of as messy of a mess of a culture of any kind of people. The Corinthian people didn't know what relationship was all about the way God would have them to be. They didn't understand what marriage really is all about. And so they're asking questions like that, and we have to come into this thing going, okay, now, now I can see that. Well, have you looked around in your American culture over the last 20 years? European culture? Maybe it is better to be celibate. But he's not saying one is better than the other in terms of spiritually. What is the purpose for marriage? How does God define marriage? How does God's gift of sex and marriage come into play? I mean, these are questions that they have. These are real questions. In Paul's day, divorce was so very common among all levels of society. It was not impossible for men and women to have married 20 times or more. The early church had members that were living together. They had people in the early church that were under arrangements for marriage in different settings. And you can imagine their confusion when they get saved, they're born again, the new creatures in Christ. They go, wait a minute, how do we do marriage the right way? God's way. What does God's word say? 
God, would you please tell me how to do it? They had these questions. In fact, we know they had these questions because Stephanus, Fortunus, Archaeus, they were uh, referenced, if you see in 1 Corinthians 16, Paul says, I am glad of the coming of Stephanus and Fortunus and Achaeus, for that which was lacking on your part, they have supplied. He interacted with them before this letter came out. Also it says in verse number 1 of chapter 7, Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me. Hmm. They had already written, and so he is writing back in response to some of the questions that they already have, wondering if he wrote another letter or he wrote something that we don't have in the Scriptures. What we have in front of us, as I said before, is 1 Corinthians chapter number 1 through 16. And this is what we go on. But we do know that Paul is alluding to the idea and thought that the people of Corinth, especially Stephanus, who, of course, is one of the very first believers in Corinth, and the household of Stephanus' reference as being something pretty awesome. They were some of the first Corinth, uh, Corinthian converts. And some of the first fruits of Paul's work. Questions about marriage, divorce and remarriage. They've been around for centuries. So it's not like we've got a subject here that's so difficult to handle. But I, I've got to do what I need to do as I always do as your pastor and say, what did Paul teach? Most of all, what is God teaching us today? What did Paul teach the church at Corinth? And they intertwine for today. We don't look at the scripture and go, well, I don't feel like teaching that. Let me teach something else. No, we're going to teach the scriptures today. And we're going to teach the Bible because I believe right here, and it alludes to our title, God has some disciplines here for marriage. God's marriage disciplines. And this might be part one of five different parts. I don't know yet, but I know as I've laid this thing out, these are disciplines. What's discipline? An order of behavior. A way of strategically choosing a method by which I will live and behave. Do you have discipline? Are you focused? Well, these are God's marriage disciplines this morning. God wants us to know that, hey, just as the Corinth church, the Corinthian church was in a mess with all their sins, it's possible that us, as today's church in America, have some of these same things to work through. Maybe not just our church alone. We have a tremendous church, and, and I'm not speaking from a place of degrading or degradation at all. I'm saying when we look at this setting in 56 to 58 AD, we realize that marriage is a little messy in terms of what people know about it, what God's disciplines are about it. Not the condition of your marriage today, but rather what does God have to say in his disciplines about marriage out of 1 Corinthians chapter number 7? Well, let's read and find out. We're going to read the first 16 verses, and then we'll get into some simple little disciplines from the word of God. Verse number 1, follow along with me. Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Very clearly, a husband marries a wife, a wife marries a husband. One is a male, one is a female. There you go. Simple. It's simple. God is throwing a fastball right down the middle. This is clear what a marriage is made out of. Let's continue. Verse number 3. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power over his own body, but the wife. Aren't pronouns important? That was free of charge. It didn't cost you or mean nothing. In Christ alone. Here we go. We continue. Verse number five, defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again, that Satan tempt not, excuse me, tempt you not for your incontinency. Verse six, but I speak this by permission and not of commandment, 
for I would that all men were even as I myself. But every man hath his proper gift of God, one after his, this matter, another after that. I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. But, verse 9, if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband, but and if she depart, let her remain unmarried, or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. Aren't these great disciplines from God? Disciplined approach to God's marriage ways. That's what we're after today. I want to know what God has to say on everything. Okay? Verse number 12. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath a husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For if the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband, else were your children unclean, but now are they holy, set apart unto the Lord. Verse 15. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. For what knoweth thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? There's a lot here. I think we should pray for a moment, and we'll get into six simple disciplines over the next few minutes. Now, Father... Again, we come to you humbly, boldly as well as the scriptures teach. We come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We need that. When we teach the word of God, we want to say what you would have us to say. So I pray as I've been praying and, and beseeching you from the first service to this one and everything in between, I want your glory to shine and I would like your purpose in your focus and your desires to be fulfilled in the name of Jesus by the power of your word and by your spirit. I pray for each person under the sound of the teaching of your word that they will hear from you, that you will uh, bind the distractions right now, and that we will learn of your disciplines when it comes to marriage. There's a lot here, God, and we just want to do the passage justice. So please, Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray that you will give us a great time teaching and preaching your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Discipline number one. Right out of the chute. Verses one and two, they reference this. We must confront sexual desires within ourselves. So we confront. Here's the first discipline. Confront sexual desires within yourself by God's word. What does God's word say? Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. The Bible teaches us very clearly from the Old Testament not to touch a woman because it is referencing sexually touching them. It says in Genesis chapter number 20, and God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. Ruth, chapter number 2. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art thirst, go unto the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. The men will not touch thee. Proverbs 6.29 So he that goeth in to his neighbor's wife, whosoever toucheth her shall not be innocent. The bottom line is that that terminology is saying it is good for a man not to touch a woman. We come off of chapter number 6 that's mentioned fornication. It comes in verse number 2. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Very simply put, when it comes to God's discipline for marriage, he's saying it's for partnership. It's provision. We want to make sure that it's clear what God says. Hey, own wife. You see that phrase? Have his own wife, have his, her own husband. 
God's first discipline is saying this, confront your sexual desires within yourself by God's word. And say, okay, by God's word, marriage is for partnership, companionship. It is also, too, for reproduction or procreation. It's for provision. We are there to provide for one another. It is for pleasure. God says there is pleasure in marriage. Let thy fountain be blessed, it says in Proverbs 5. And rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Let her be as the hubby hind and pleasant roe. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times. And be thou ravished always with her. With her. It's for pleasure. It's for purity. God is telling us this is for purity. This is a picture and type of Jesus Christ and the church. And Jesus Christ and the believer. Ephesians 5, verses 22 through 23. Boy, oh boy, how beautiful it is for God to show us how to be disciplined, but also to have his disciplines on marriage. How many young people ignore God's disciplines for marriage and then get down the road and go, duh, what have I done? And then you beg for God's forgiveness and mercy and you want God to reconcile a matter and he'll do it and then you'll spend the rest of your life making it better. I was talking with my friend the other day and he was joking about something he heard a Markism or a Brownieism the other day, but it's something I just stole from somebody else, and you know that. You may not know how to do something biblically, and so you've been in a place of ignorance for a long time. But once God shows it to you, now you're responsible for it. And he now will hold you accountable from that moment on. Well, I didn't know what to do before. Fine. But he's teaching the Corinthian church who grew up in a bunch of idolatry, messy stuff like you are. Have you checked around the corner of the street yesterday, today, and tomorrow? It's messy out there. The world is telling you that you don't have to have God's disciplines. You just figure out how to have your discipline. Woo! You better be an awful disciplined soul if you can handle the attacks from this world and from your flesh. The devil doesn't have to do a whole lot, but there's one thing he's really interested in on messing up the church. Number two, your marriage. Oh, he's good. He wants to mess up the church and he wants to mess up the marriage. Discipline number one. Discipline number two, reconcile intimacy desires for your spouse by God's word. Remember, the Corinthian people, they were told to avoid fornication. They understand that they have, again, lived this idolatrous life. They know that the way that they approach marriage was very, very simple. Have a marriage. Doesn't work out? Have another marriage. Have another marriage. And then have another marriage. Paul did truly know what kind of people he was dealing with here. And so he gave them a little bit of slack. But he's bringing the truth of the word of God and he's saying, hey, when it comes to your marriage and the intimacy of the marriage and how you're supposed to be close, you need to reconcile these matters. You need to communicate through them and reconcile intimacy desires for your spouse by God's word. What does it say? Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and the likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power over her own body, but, be, but the husband, and likewise also husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Very simply this. Let me just give you a simple statement and definition. When it says due benevolence, it means this. The disposition to do what's good. To do what's good. Not what's evil, but what's good. Not bad, but good. Abuse in a marriage is not right. Physical, sexual, emotional, none of it's good. It's not right. Due benevolence simply means this. Charitableness. Love never fails. God's love is charity. Charitableness. Do benevolence to the other person. The love of another person with a desire to promote, not your own, but the other's happiness. You are there for the other person.
Guys, you don't exist for yourself in your marriage. Sorry. You better get over yourself. Jesus gave his life for the church. He gave his life for you. And so you say in premarital, I want to be like Jesus to my wife. Fifteen minutes down the road, I want to be like me. You stink. You smell. You get yourself in a lot of trouble when you smell like you and stink like you. And I'm not talking about your cologne. You reconcile the intimacy desires. You don't defraud. What does that word defraud mean? Look at verse number five. Defraud someone? Are you What does it mean? Defraud ye not one another? Ooh. To defraud someone? You can imagine that if you're in a place where God says don't defraud somebody, you have to really be serious. Defrauding your marriage partner places him or her in a position of un necessary temptation. Defraud means to deprive of some right interest or property by some deceitful device, to withhold from wrongfully, to actually cheat someone. Satan loves to get in there on that one. Here's my point and what the scriptures say. Defraud, don't cheat one another. Unless, as you defraud, you hold back something, it's within a consent. You communicate with one another. You talk with one another. That you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again. That Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. That's what he's saying. My discipline for you is that you protect what I have given you. You cannot prevent everything, but you can surely protect with the idea that when you have a chance to prevent it, you prevent it. That's what he's saying here. You need to reconcile intimacy with your spouse. On the other side of things, we know that in this idea, this world, this cultural shift of saying that anything goes, everything's all right, it's not. Stop bringing stuff into your marriage that will destroy it. Watch out. Discipline number three. Embrace spiritual desires for celibacy by God's word. What are we saying here? This is a place when you hear some verbiage from Paul, you say, is he just not having an inspired word? No, every, every Bible verse is inspired by the word of God. He's saying you can do it the way I do it or do it the way that others do it. I'm just saying this is what I personally done. It says in verse number 6, But I speak this by permission, and not of commandment. For I would that all men were even as I myself, but every man hath proper gift of God, one after this matter, and another after that. Embrace spiritual desires for celibacy by God's word. Okay, what do I mean? Well, I'll just get, get ahead, but we'll get this later. Chapter number 7, look at verse number 32. Let me read it. But I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried care for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married care for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. Verse number 34. There is no, there is, excuse me, there is difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and spirit. But she that is married careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. Hallelujah. But Jesus Christ has to be first. Always. The spiritual desires you have for the Lord. Girls, my husband is not the spiritual leader of my home. And I'm mad at him. I'm not mocking you. I'm saying that stinks. So, what about your spiritual desires? Well, you know what I need to do? I need to leave him because he's not a good spiritual leader. Is that what it says? Nope. Embrace that beautiful spiritual desire. You say, well, I'm supposed to be celibate. Not once you're married. Uh-uh. So what do you do? Well, before you enter marriage, understand that Paul is saying that it might be better for you to be alone. If you have that gift, then embrace it. If you do not, that's okay too. Either choice is good, but Jesus Christ needs to be number one in your marriage. 
In fact, Jesus Christ needs to be number one in your life. As the old phrase goes, Oh, I, I married the love of my wife. She is so wonderful. He, he is so wonderful. I love him so. I, there's no one I could ever love. He is like, oh, my. Oh, oh. That's what Cheryl says to me. We just had our 37th, 37th year anniversary the other day. That's, that was her little card she wrote to me. Did you give me a card? Oh, you're out. No, just. The love of your life is Jesus Christ. The love of your life has to be Jesus Christ. Wives would love it if their husbands were like that. And husbands would love it if their wives were like that. I'm just telling you. Give it a try. Start tomorrow. Start tonight. With God's disciplines here, your spiritual desires for celibacy, by God's word, if that's what has to be. Remember, he's dealing with three different people. The unmarried means that they were married and they're no longer married. Paul says he is that. Ah, what does that mean? Make an appointment. I'll talk to you later. Was Paul ever married? This is the passage where it makes you wonder. He says, I would have you to be as me, which is unmarried. The unmarried is something that someone who is married, and they're no longer married. Someone who's a widow or widower, you can stay celibate or you can get married again. Someone who's a virgin, that means they've never been married. Three different kinds of people. Okay? You understand? That's what the Bible says. Number four. Manage marriage desires birth of lust by God's word. Some people say, well, this verse says I can just marry anybody because I am going to burn. Get yourself under control. Here you go. Verse number eight. Here you go. Paul is dealing with something in the Corinthian people which can happen in any church, any bunch of believers. I say, therefore, to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. He just called himself unmarried and widows. He didn't say he was a virgin. Verse number 9. But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. Manage marriage desires, birth of lust by God's word. You notice I put God's word, you've got to get into God's word for things to be better and to make things work in your desires properly. you got a half an hour in the word, get an hour in. You're a single man or a single woman, get two hours in a day. Get more time in the word of God because the world's coming after you to rip your soul apart when it comes to marriage and relationships. If you don't think so, you're, you're just not, you're not getting it. I've had the honor and privilege of doing over 60 weddings, and I'm thankful for so many of them that are doing well, but not so many are as well. I'm not criticizing. I'm not upset. I'm just telling you, it's heartbreaking. So if you're going to get married, just don't pick somebody to pick somebody because the Bible says I don't want to burn because I have these sexual desires because I'm lustful. How about you spend time, more time in the Word of God? Since Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy over my soul like the he can change it all. And put us on a place where you will marry the right woman or the right man someday. That will be beautiful. But if you've learned something today that you did not know before, hallelujah, from this point on, God's going to hold you accountable you see, when we manage marriage desires, birth of lust by God's word, we're saying very simply this. I cannot just pick to pick, but I must, if God would have me, and I just can't stay single, then I need to find the right woman. Please, God. Please, God. I'm a woman, and I have this, this strong desire to not be alone. Oh, I pray, God, you will bring the right man into my life. Please, God. Lust should not be given the place to run wild. Your last two. Discipline number five. You diminish divorce desires with hope by God's word. Look at verses 10, 11. This is really good stuff. We finish strongly with these next couple. Watch this. You say, well, this doesn't, eh. Oh, this is good. This is really good doctrine and really good truth here. Watch this. To diminish divorce desires with hope for God's word. This is, this is free of charge. 
Watch out for the divorce desire bug. It started a long time ago. Culturally speaking, in the Corinthian culture, Mary divorce, Mary divorce was a common thing. Ephesus, Thessalonica. You've got a lot of strong Grecian and Roman influence. Idolatry. Pornography is rough today. The pornography back then, it wasn't on an iPhone. It was right out in front of you. It's always been around. The debauchery and filth of the nation of Israel. Moses, I mean, come on now. Let's just think for a moment. Moses goes up to spend time with God to come down and get the law. And when he comes down, his brother, the priest, and he answers him like somebody else made him do it. It's been around for a few thousand years. In our, la in our flesh, it gets really messy. You know, there's no good thing that dwells. So here I am looking at verses 10, 11, 12. I'm going, wow. If they can't, excuse me, uh, verse number 10, and unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. And if, but and if she depart, what if at Corinth someone gets saved, the husband or the wife, and now one of them is born again, the other one is not? But if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. Okay, so you're no longer together, but don't get married. And maybe you can reconcile back to your husband and let not the husband away his wife. So don't put the wife away. Don't do it. Verse number 12. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believe not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. Okay? So it's okay to stay married. But he also says, let me help you with this divorce desire because there's a hope by God's word that the person would get saved. But let me just speak to you about this whole principle. And he says in verse 13, And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. So don't put her away. You don't leave him. Verse 14. Great verse. This is just great grace. Great godly grace. He says in verse 14, For the unbelieving a husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Don't you love that word, sanctified? Three amens will be good. Thank you. I mean, that's a good word. That's a good principle. It's a great doctrine. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. They're set apart unto the Lord. Because one of the two is born again. With the hope that one day the spouse will come to know Jesus Christ as Savior. Amen? Woo. Hallelujah for salvation. Hallelujah for grace and mercy. Hallelujah for God's sanctifying power. God has put together so many, so many broken people. Why would you not hope and pray he could put one more together? Paul's saying, look, discipline number five, diminish the divorce desires with the hope by God's word that something incredible could happen. Ooh. I know divorcement was there. Paul is dealing with it. Jesus spoke to the Pharisees, Matthew 19. The Pharisees challenged Jesus. I'll just read a couple verses of this and move on to finish up. In Matthew 19, you can look it up. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting, saying to him, Is a lawful man to go put, put away his wife for every cause? And he answered them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And he said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God had joined together... Let no man put asunder. Every preacher says that at the end of every marriage. You found it in Gospel of Mark, too. But of course, they go into, hey, what about Moses, the commander, writing the bill of divorcement? What does he say? 
Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. God made a provision, but he didn't give permission. Correct? For the hardness of your hearts, that will break your heart. Last discipline, discipline number six. Understand leaving desires, the leaving, the desire to leave, can be in peace by God's word. By God's word. By God's word. Look at this, verse 15 and 16. But if the unbelieving depart, if they choose that, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases to go grab them back. Not under bondage. But they can keep the marriage going if they so choose. He says, the end of verse number 15, but God hath called us to peace. Understand leaving desires can be in peace by God's word because it says in verse 16, just to remind you that you're not God. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Do you have the power to do that? Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? Don't play God. Just be like Jesus Christ. Forgive. Long-suffering. Restore. Reconcile. Do all you can. And if the unbelieving say they have to go, okay. We do it in peace. We don't want it to happen, but we do it in peace. God's word tells us how to have these disciplines when it comes to marriage. It really is a good foundational piece for any of you that know somebody that's not married yet. Teach them what the Word of God says about these are the disciplines that will get you started in your marriage. There's much more, and we'll cover it. As I said today when I started, there's a disclaimer here. This is not the whole thing on marriage. I didn't say that we would. But these are some really good disciplines when it comes to, hey, where's your marriage at? What can you do with your marriage? Maybe there's some hurting marriages in our church. So I finish with this invitation. What can marriage be like? This is in the present tense. What can marriage be like for believers and God's family if it is lived out in Christ alone? Oh, what can marriage be like? Our invitation time of prayer today, will you pray for your marriage? If you're married today, and if you're not, would you pray for the marriages in our church and the future marriages that are about to come somewhere down the road? There's a lot of young people in first service. They might come home today and ask you, what was that brownie talking about? You teach them how to do things right before they get to a point where they don't know what to do. And if you don't know what to do, you give me a call. You give Bobby a call. Brian, Dwayne, Josh, Steve. We'll direct you to the Word of God because these are God's disciplines on how to do marriage. Would you please bow for a word of prayer? You can come and pray anytime. If you would just pray for marriages, I'd be really happy. But I know God would be even happier. Our Father in heaven, we just come to you simply and humbly. Knowing that, God, your word is true and real and the disciplines for marriage are right. As Paul taught it, the Spirit of God taught it. It's for our church, for even the Corinthian church, I pray. Dear God. Oh, Father. Have mercy. Put together that which is broken. Prevent 
and get in the way of some things that are headed in the wrong. And I pray you'd find your church in a place of prayer. I pray for this invitation time. I pray for our marriages. God, I pray that you'll provide and protect them like you never have before in this church and the family of God. We need you. There's so many people headed into a mess that they don't even know. I pray, God, for this church, for our men and women, those that are married and those that are not, that, God, we'd find your way to do things, to be better in Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Please stand.